Okay. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do on this paper is to draw up a grid which is going to be used as a score sheet. So you want four columns, so get a, make a rectangle with four columns and 12 rows. So just four vertical lines and then 13 horizontal lines to make 12 rows. So when you've made your, your grid with three columns vertical and 12 rows horizontal, just number the left-hand column, 1 to 12, down the side from top to bottom. You don't need to fill in the middle bit. Just number the numbers down the left-hand side and put across the top three columns. So hey, where my cursor is pointing, just number 1 to 12 down the side there. And then across the top, write F on the top. And then P and then R. So you've got three columns at the top labeled F, P, R, and then down the side you've got 12 rows. Okay. No, it's only a word. I'm not, I'm not going to actually. I need it. You can't see it from, from the back. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. So just, so don't write in the ABCs, just write FPR at the top, and 1 to 12 down the side. It doesn't need to be a work of art. It's just something for you to record your answers on. So you don't need a ruler or anything special. I'm not going to collect it from you. It's just for your benefit. Okay, just raise your hand when you finish. So I have a rough idea. Okay, thank you. Raise your hand if you haven't finished. Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes. So just 1 to 12 down the left-hand side, FPR across the top. Okay. Let me come out of this and get out of here. Right. I'm going to ask you some questions, and there are simple multiple choice questions, A, B, C. So if your answer to the question is A, then write in the first column, which is the A column. If the answer is B, write your answer in the second column and C. So for question one, a would be the first answer. If your answer is B, put it in the second column. <coughs> if your answer is C, put it in the third column. Do you get that? Okay. So based on your current situation, which of these alternatives is most important to you? A, enjoying the pleasure of the moment. B, planning for the future. Or C, surviving from day to day. So A would be the first column, B would be the second column, and C would be, just put a tick or a mark in the third column. No. So you're on number one now. So on number one, the first column is, is where you'd put your answer if it's A. If your answer is B, you put it into the second column. And if your answer is C, you put it into the third column. Okay? Is that, are we all clear? Next question. What do you think you would what do you think would be your emotional response to receiving a, an unexpected sum of money equivalent to one month's pay? A. Would you be relieved and save it in the bank for a rainy day? Or B, would you be excited and think about treating yourself? Or C, would you wonder if you could possibly make it grow faster? than they may interest on the bank savings account. Okay? So the first column is the tick if your answer is A. Second column tick if your answer is B. Third column tick if your answer is C. Okay? Let me just get my glasses.
Okay. Next question. What generally forms the major part of your motivation? A, striving for success. B, trying to avoid failure or hardship. Or C, enjoying life and having fun. So write down your answer. So your first column would be striving for success. B is trying to avoid failure and hardship. And C is enjoying life and having fun. Next question. How important is it for you that your friends see your prosperity? Moderately important, extremely important, or not important? Okay. Next question. Which of the following reasons for borrowing money would you consider in the future? A, to treat yourself. B, to pay off debts that are accruing a higher interest, or C, to save it in the bank for future needs. Okay. Next question. How important is it to you to own the latest model of popular goods and appliances? A, extremely important because I don't want to be out of date. B, not important because if the old model works, I am happy to continue using it. Or C, not bothered either way because material goods are not important to me. Okay. Next question. How do you feel about borrowing money? I feel excited just as if the money was a gift. B, it makes me feel nervous because I worry about whether I will be able to pay it back. Or C, I feel optimistic but try to increase it before I have to return it. Next question. If you owned a number of prestige cars, would you consider your cars to be a good investment? A, yes, because each car is worth a lot of money. B, no, because their value would continue to decrease over time. Or C, yes, because wealth attracts wealth. Next question, what type of shopper are you? A, I always plan what I want to purchase before I go to the shop. B, I enjoy wandering through the shops and buying on impulse. C, I enjoy trying to find a bargain or negotiating with the retailer for a lower price. Next question, how often do you think of business ideas? Every day, hardly ever, or never. Okay. Now, the reason why I ask you these questions, there's one more, actually. Which of the opinions below do you think is most important for one wishing to start a business? A, a healthy fear of failure, or B, clear ideas with relevant specific knowledge and experience, or C, academic qualifications. And next one, which of the business types listed below do you prefer? I want to be involved in every aspect of the business from production right through to marketing and strategic planning. Or B, I prefer to focus on strategic overview and leave the main business operations to other employees. Or C, I want to be a sole trader with no other individuals involved in my business. Right. Now, the reason why I ask you these questions is just to get you thinking. Um, we're not going to score, score the questions now. We'll, we'll, I'll let you think about those questions as we go on, because you might revise your answers by the time we come to an end. The questions that I asked you came from a, a book, which some of you have read, called The Rich, the Poor, and the Foolish. How many of you have read that book? Good. Those of you who haven't read it, read it. You can get it from that website. So 
There are certain biblical principles that hold people back or make them progress, depending on what they choose to believe. So it's important to understand what you read when you read the Bible. So 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So, according to John, when he wrote to his brethren, he was saying, I want you to prosper, that's financially, and have good health. And if you have the two, then you can be a force for good, a greater force for good in this world. But there are many people that have a negative view of prosperity because of what some prosperous people do with their money and how some people give themselves a bad reputation by the way they raise money. And because of that, some biblical passages are misunderstood. So let me share some of them with you. There are those who say, rich is bad. And they'll quote James chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, which says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your misery that shall come upon you. Then verse 2 and 3, your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped up treasures together for the last days. What is this passage telling us about becoming wealthy? Anybody just raise your hand and tell me what you think it's saying. Is it saying... Becoming wealthy is a good thing? Is it saying becoming wealthy is a bad thing? Or is it telling you something else? What you have done with the money? Anyone else? See, many people read this passage and they think, if you, have, if you have no money and you're looking for an excuse to say, well, the reason why I have no money is because money is bad, then you'll read that and say, see, those who have money, it will just be a witness against them in the last days. But if, whenever you read scriptures, it's really important to continue reading. Don't just stop as soon as you think you've got an answer. So the next verse, verse 4, explains why verse 1 to 3 were written. It says, Because the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your field, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. So this is a scripture condemning those who have become wealthy because of fraud. They have caused people to reap their fields, they've made a lot of money, and then they didn't pay the laborers who did the work for them. This is the kind of thing that James is condemning here, those who raise money with fraudulent means. Here is another passage that many people believe speaks against money. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveting after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. I've highlighted the word flee these things. What are you supposed to, what is this telling you to flee from? Just raise your hand and shout out the answer. What is, what is this, what is Paul telling Timothy to flee from? Yes? That's right. He's not saying flee from money. He's saying flee from the love of money and from covetousness. So it, the love of money, which while some coveting after have erred from the faith. So you need to flee from the covetousness that leads to the love of money. Listen to this one. Many people think this is the strongest indication that we Christians should live a poor life because poor is synonymous with humility. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what I want you to do is get together with one person next to you or two to have a small discussion. And 
I'm going to give you a question. According to this scripture, I'm going to ask you a question. Does this mean that as your wealth increases, your chances of being saved decrease? Because it is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Okay, discuss for a couple of minutes with someone nearby you, and then I'm going to ask you for some feedback. So I'll leave the text on the screen. I want you to try and explain to me what it's talking about. Okay, 30 more seconds, then I'm going to ask for some feedback. Does this roving mic work so I can pass it around? Thank you. Will you be the runner? Thank you. Okay. So someone comes to you and says, the Bible says, a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of God. Does this mean that as your wealth increases, your chances of being saved decrease? Anyone can raise your hand and what would you say? I think your chances, your chance to go into everybody has got the same chance. So that your chance wouldn't be taken away from you. It just means your life, it will be a harder battle for you. Because a lot of people who have money use money to seek something that um, only can be replaced by God. So if they're not, if they're not spiritually fulfilled and not um, using God in their lives, then they will try to use money to purchase what it is that they need to fill that void. Um, so that so, when you have money, you don't need to worry about it like most of us do. So you're free to do things that most people haven't got the opportunity to do. So that's that's how I feel about it. Money, money means that we have to worry about life. We have to worry about where we're going to pay our bills and stuff. These people don't have to worry about that, so they've got the freedom to do other things. Um, and that means they're more tempted to do other things that they know they shouldn't do. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? There's a hand at the back and left-hand side. We, we looked at it that it depends on your mentality because um, if you see, if you... If you are focused on God, then it wouldn't be about your mentality. But reading this text, we also said that, of course, the rich man would lose his salvation because the richer would always try to get richer. So they'll go through different schemes or whatever to un un tactics to make more money. And they won't be focusing on God at all. So that's where they would lose their soul salvation. Thank you. Anyone else? Jesus said, the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Does this mean, as your wealth increases, your chances of being saved decrease? It links with the um, previous text that we read saying the love of money, which mm -hmm. is the root of all evil. So um, if the rich man loves his money, that's when it would be difficult for him. Okay. Now, many texts in the New Testament um, were so difficult to understand that even the disciples of Jesus didn't understand what he was trying to say. So quite often in the Gospels, after Jesus spoke to the crowd, the disciples would come back to him afterwards quietly and say, Jesus, explain what you meant, because we didn't understand. And this text was a subject of just such a conversation. We read in Mark chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, that Jesus, this is how Mark remembered the rest of the conversation. He said, And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? And then it goes on to, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered them again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it? It is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he wasn't, Jesus wasn't saying riches prevents you from going into heaven. It is trusting in the riches. 
Having said that, it is very difficult to have wealth and not trust in it. For example, if your rent is due and you got no money, who do you trust? God or your friends or your parents. When they run out, you pray and say, Lord, please provide. And God does provide, and he has provided for us. That's why we're still alive. But if the rent is due and you've got the money on the bank, you don't think about parents or friends or prayer. You think, well, the money is there, the bills are there. I trust that when I go to the bank, all will be well. And so trusting in money can give you a sense of security that is false. So the only people that should have a lot of money are those that can have it without trusting in it. That's what Jesus is saying. If you can manage money without trusting in it, without the money making you feel secure, more secure than God would, then have it. So some people, if you have, give them 100 pounds, they're still trusting God. Give them 1,000 pounds, their trust in God gets weaker now because they're, they're trusting in the 1,000. If you give them a million pounds, some of them will just leave the church. Say, I don't need God now, I've got all this money. So it depends upon how much you will trust it as to what, you, what effect it will have on your life. Here is a serious warning. He that getteth riches, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end he shall be a fool. That means, if you get money by means that is not according to God's laws, then you and your money will part company in one of two ways. Either you will live to lose the money, or you will die and leave the money. Either way is not a good prospect. So make sure that whatever money you obtain, you obtain it by honest means. But Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. So there is a worldly riches, and there's a riches that comes from the blessing of God. And an example of that riches is found in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. When God blessed Solomon, Solomon just asked for wisdom, and God, as a result of the wisdom, gave him power and wealth, and success in battle. And if you lived in Israel during the time of Solomon, gold was so plenteous that silver was worth less. Now, if you were walking down the road now and you saw a golf ball size of solid silver and nobody wanted it, you'd pick it up and run and sell it because that's worth money. But if you lived in Jerusalem during the time of Solomon, and you saw a blob of silver on the ground, you would kick it out of the way. Because gold was so plenteous that silver was as worthless as the stones. That's how rich Israel became when they followed God under Solomon. That's when Solomon was in the phase of following God before he went astray himself. So here are some basic principles of wealth. Everything in the world already belongs to God. It is already his. And God is looking for people who will manage it for his kingdom. So if God gives you a lot of money, and he knows that as a result of the extra money he gives you, more work for his kingdom will be done, he will give you more. If he knows that as a result of giving you more money, you will just spend more of it on yourself, then he won't give you more because there's only so much you can spend on yourself before it becomes destructive. So when you recognize that everything you own belongs to God, the first question you need to ask when you receive money is, God, what do you want me to do with this? And then when he tells you, then that will actually be a blessing to you rather than a curse. Now, there are different kinds of business. And I'll just give you a brief idea of what the three types of business are. Stage one business is the sole trader. This is where you open your own business and you run it by yourself. So you, whether you're buying or selling, you buy and then you sell it yourself. Or whether you're providing a service, you provide the service yourself. 
That's level one business, the lowest level. The reason why it's the lowest level is because that kind of business is limited by the amount of time in a day. So when that day finishes, your business stops and you can't go any further. When you're sick, your business stops. That's level one business. Level two business is where you take on employees. So you get a few people to, do, to join with you and then you work together. Now you're a small business with a few employees. Now you can do more than you can do by yourself. If you're sick, your employees continue. If you're on holiday, your employees continue. And between them, they can earn more for you than you could earn for yourself. That's level two business. Level three business is what Richard Branston uses, and Sir Lord Sugar, and Jonathan Bernstein, and all the rest of the, the super rich people. And this is what they do. Level three business involves setting up companies, getting those companies to run, getting a manager to manage those companies on your behalf, and once they are running, you leave them, collect the money that is yours on a regular basis, and then you go and set up another company. You get it running, you establish it, you appoint a manager over it, you make sure they pay you your dues on a monthly basis, and then you carry on and get another business. When you use that model, there is no limit to the number of businesses you can set up. Because once it's established, it no longer takes up your time. So therefore, you're free to carry on. There is one thing about this business that makes it success or fail. What is the, the crucial thing that makes you able to do a level three business? Can I hear an answer? Trust. Trust in your managers. Because the thing that stops people from moving from level two, where you are in the business keeping an eye on everybody, to level three, where you set it up and put a manager and leave and go and do something else, is finding a manager you can trust. Because if you find a manager who you can't trust, he or she will just steal your business. And before long, they become your competitors. They copy your ideas, they rebrand your products as theirs, and before long, they will leave your company and set up another company exactly the same as yours, on a different logo, and you've got a competitor. So in order to be a level three business person, you have to find people you can trust. God wants level three business people in every one of us. And before he can trust us, he has to give us the test of trust. If we pass the trust test, which is an ongoing test, then he will use us as level three people. This is the test. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. Now, some people struggle with this. If you have 10 pounds, and God says, give me back one-tenth, then you say, okay, Lord, here is your pound, I'll keep the nine. And that is a relatively easy thing to do. If you had 10,000 pounds, and God says, give me a tenth, then the tenth is a thousand pounds, but you keep the other 9,000. For some people, it becomes harder now because we're giving God a thousand pounds. Imagine what you could do with an extra thousand pounds. You don't think about the fact that he just gave you 9,000. You just think, I'm giving back a thousand pounds. What if you had a hundred thousand pounds? That means God's tenth is 10,000 pounds. Imagine coming to church with a tight envelope and the check is for 10,000 pounds. You see, as the numbers increase, the temptation to be unfaithful to God also increases because the bit you are returning to him looks bigger and bigger and bigger and you think about what you can do with it rather than what he has given you, the other nine tenths. And that's why it is an ongoing test because God will prove you with small amount and see if you're faithful to him. As you increase, if becoming faithful to him gets more and more difficult for you, 
then God will say, okay, I'll stop you at that level because you can't handle any more. But if you can return your tenth, no matter how high your income increases, then God will be able to trust you. Because God is looking for people who he can trust so that he can rechannel the wealth of this world into his kingdom. And you are his kingdom builders. But if he gives you the money to transfer into his kingdom, and you say, yippee, right, I'm going to change my Ford into a Ferrari, and I'm going to change my one bedroom into a seven bedroom, suddenly God will say, I can't use you. Because that's not why I gave it to you. A friend of mine went to the Caribbean. I won't tell you which country, which island it was, because some of you might be from there. <laughs> he went to the Caribbean to visit his relatives. He, was, he lived in England. And when he got there, he had a wonderful time with his relatives. And when he was coming back, he had about 200 pounds worth of local currency in notes still in his pocket. And he didn't need it when he was coming back to England. So he turned to his relative and said, I don't need this money now. Have it. So he gave him about 200 pounds worth of local dollars, which is thousands of dollars. And his relative was overjoyed and thanked him profusely and put the money in his pocket. And he was so happy. And my friend and his relative continued to the airport. When my friend got to the airport, he realized that he needed $20 for the airport tax in local currency. So he turned to his relative, who he had just given thousands of dollars, and said, give me $20 of that money that I just gave you for the airport tax. You know what his relative said? I'm sorry, I can't afford it. I've already accounted for all of that. You'll have to go to the cash point over there and take some money. This is true. So my friend, after it soaked in that he couldn't believe what he had just heard, said, oh, all right, no problem. And he went over to the cash point, withdrew the money, paid his airport tax, and returned to England. When he returned to England, he stopped sending money for that relative. Before that, he was paying for that relative to buy his house, to put all of his children through school. Hundreds of thousands of pounds were going into that relative's bank account to help his family. But that relative made a short change. He exchanged $20, and as a result, all of that money stopped. The hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of dollars, which was going to finish his house and put the rest of the children through school, stopped. Now, when you think about that, you think that relative is a very, very foolish man because he should have known where his money was coming from. He should have recognized how much money had just been given him <coughs> and to give back 20 should have been nothing to him. He should have said, oh, how much do you want? 20, 40, 50? It doesn't matter. Do you want all of it back? Because you are the one who's financing my life. But instead, he held on to what was in his hand and missed out on all the blessings that were going to follow. That's what we do when we fail to return God's tenth. God says, I gave you ten. Give me back one. If you say, Lord, I can't afford the one because I've got plans for it, God will say, okay, you know what I was going to send you? I won't bother. I'm not going to send that to you anymore. And all the blessings that were going to be opened through the windows of heaven and poured out upon you will stop because you have made the wrong choice. So be a level three business person and allow God to prove you in every detail. And as he proves you, he will be able to do greater things through you. Think of heaven like a safe. You know, There's a combination to opening the safe. And once you open it, then everything in it is yours. And the combination is cheerful giving and faithful tithing. Now, many people, because of their understanding of the lifestyle of Jesus, believe, in combination with the other scriptures that we read, that Jesus was poor, he is our example, therefore we should be poor. It is true that Jesus never owned a house or he never bought a house. Does that mean we should never buy houses? See, Jesus was here for a short time to do a mission and go back to his house. So he was just passing through. But the question is, was Jesus poor? If you want to follow his actual example, 
answer the question. Matthew 8, verse 20, Jesus said unto him, when somebody came and said, Lord, I want to follow you. He said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. So many say, see, Jesus was poor. If we want to follow him, we must have a poor lifestyle. So let's ask some questions about Jesus. Why was Jesus born in a stable? Because he was poor? The hotel was full. You see, the parents of Jesus were not planning to go to the stable. They had booked to go in the hotel. But because there was no phone or no way of sending a message, they could not pre-book the hotel. They had to just turn up, and it was first come, first served. And by the time they arrived, because Mary was pregnant and they had to ride slowly, the day was long and the hotel was full. But they had the money to stay in the hotel. They ended up in the stable because there was no room in the inn. So the fact that Jesus was born in a stable, it is good that the poor can identify with him because of where he was born, but it was not a shortage of money that caused him to end up there. It was because there was no room. What gifts did the wise men bring to Jesus? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They didn't bring gifts from their families. They brought gifts from their country. Now, if you were traveling across the world representing England, and you're bringing a gift to somebody in a different country, to, the, to a king. Would you bring a small gift similar to what you'd give to your friend as a birthday present? No. You'd bring something representing your country, because this is a king. The wise men came representing their country. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What happened to that enormous wealth that they brought? They gave it to Joseph and Mary, who took it home with them, and it became added to their estate, in which Jesus grew up. Despite the fact that they already had money and the wise men gave them even more, Jesus worked with his hands. And in those days, just like now, carpentry was a good job because all the houses were made out of wood and stone. So Jesus had a trade. Now we look at the disciples and Jesus' mission. What was the role of Judas among the disciples? Judas was the treasurer. So ask yourself the question, if Jesus and his disciples were poor people, why would they need a treasurer? If 12 of you went, made a group and, and started traveling together, would you need a treasurer? You wouldn't, unless you had enough money to need to start making accounts and managing it centrally. Judas was a greedy person, and he requested to join the disciples because he knew that there was money involved, and he wanted to be manager of it. John chapter 3, verse 28 and 29 this is around the communion table. And it says, you know, and nobody knew for what intent, when Jesus said to Judas, whatever you're going to do, do quickly. And Judas got up and walked out. And John says, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought that because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that were needed against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Judas had the bag. What bag? What was in the bag? He had the bag of money that they traveled with. And Jesus, the disciples thought Jesus was sending him out to buy something for the poor with the money that was in the bag. So in the disciples' mind, they were not the poor. They were the people who gave money to the poor. The parable of the talents in the New Testament. A man went away and left the talents with 
his servants. Some, one he gave five, one he gave two, and one he gave one. Now, many people read this and talk about their talents. You know, if you, if you can sing, then sing, and, and God will increase your talent. If you can speak, speak, and God will increase your talent. Whatever you do, use it for God, and God will increase your talent. That is good. But in the biblical times, when you heard the word talent, what did the word talent mean? Money? Talent was a measure of weight, just like kilogram or pound. So when he's talking about five talents, two talents, and one talent, he's talking about a weight of gold or silver as the money that they should deal with. And then here comes the challenge. Use this money for whatever you see fit, but when you have finished with it, I want there to be more left over than the amount you started with. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk to each other now. And this is the scenario. I want you to imagine that I've given the two of you, as a group, 10,000 pounds. Okay, just a reasonably small amount of money. 10,000 pounds. And I say to you, you do whatever you want with this money, but in one year from now, I'm going to call you. And when I call you, I want to hear what you've done with the money, and I want you to give me all my money back plus, plus more. Right, discuss for a few minutes. What would you do with that money? Bearing in mind that in 12 months' time, I want all of the money back plus more. What would you do with it? Okay, now give me your attention again. Now, what you have just done is the most important part of this seminar. Because right now, while you're talking, some business ideas were born. Amen. Some plans were put in place. And if you had more time, and I want you to continue these discussions afterwards, and put flesh on them. And if there are gaps in them, talk to other people to fill in the gaps. And when you have formulated your plan, do it with whatever you have. Because the grave is the richest place in the world. Because there you will find all the books that were never written. All the inventions that could have changed the world that got put on the back burner. All the businesses that could have been set up that were never done because someone thought that they would fail, so they didn't try. The difference between those who succeed and those who fail or live a mediocre life is not education. It is not the ideas. It is not even money. It is the courage to put the ideas into practice. I'll end with a couple of principles to help you. First one is wealth. Wealth is created when there is a surplus. So if you think of that glass of water, everything in that glass is what it takes for your living. So your food, your clothes, your transport, you need one glass full just to stay alive. Whatever overflows is what you have left after you have paid your living cost bills. So, if at the end of the month, you have spent every single penny that has come in just to stay alive, then you can't start any business because you never have a surplus. In order to start something, you need to create a surplus after your bills have been paid. There are two ways to create a surplus. You can either increase your income or decrease 
your living costs. Either way, you'll create a surplus. And many people only think of increasing their income. And the problem is, if you, as you increase your income, the temptation to increase your living standard to match your income is very high. So you get more money, buy a better car. Get more money, buy more clothes. Get more money, live in a more expensive neighborhood, more expensive property. If you continue doing that, you will never be able to have a surplus. Because as your income increases, you'll just use it up with a more expensive lifestyle. And then you'll never be able to do any business because you've got nothing to do it with. So what God wants you to be able to do is have an increase, but be content with where you are. So the increase becomes a surplus. See, if God knows that if he gives you more, you will raise your living standards and have no more left over, then he can't do anything with you. But if he knows that if he gives you more, that surplus will become useful to him because you already be content with where you live. Then he can give you more. That's why 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 is so important. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So if God gives you more, but you're already content with what you have, then the extra becomes a surplus. Then you can say to God, what shall I do as this surplus accumulates? And then God can do something with you. The next principle is deferred gratification. Many people want everything now. And the shops encourage you to do that. You have no money? Don't worry. Buy now, pay later. And there's nothing worse than paying for things that have already been used up. This is a little test. Those of you, when you get your children, if you ever have children, or if you have to look after children, you can try try this experiment on them. It's called the marshmallow test. But you can do it with anything nice. Just imagine these children love to eat marshmallows. So you put one in front of each child, and you can say, you can eat it whenever you want. Let's see who can sit in front of it the longest without eating it. Now, if the child is about one year old, they won't even be able to hesitate. They'll pick it up straight in their mouth. They they will not be able to stop. Deferred gratification, they wouldn't have learned that yet. When they get to two, they may be able to hold out for about 15 or 20 seconds, and then out their hand will go. And as you get older, you develop the ability to see something that you want now, but choose to wait. You need to be able to do that in order to do business. Otherwise, you'll just spend everything that you accumulate, and you'll never develop anything to invest. The the second is be prepared to endure some short-term hardship in order for a long-term goal. So yes, there are things that you want, but be prepared to go without them, so that later on you can have more of them. And Jesus exemplified this principle when he looked towards the cross. He endured the pain of the cross because of the joy that was going to happen afterwards, the joy of accomplishment. In his case, the accomplishment of saving his children. So in your quest to move from your old life to your new life, be prepared to put gratification aside for a while. And finally... Make a plan. If you fail to plan, as they say, you have already planned to fail. So don't just say, I want to do this, and rush in and start, and end up with an unfinished building where your money can't go any further, and people laugh at you, living in the foundations. For which of you entering into a, to build a tower sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Make a plan. So, to revise, make sure that you recognize that everything is God's. Return to God what is his. Otherwise, he won't be able to trust you with any more. Be prepared to suffer short-term pain for long-term gain. Also, defer your gratification and make a plan. Consult with each other, because very often in our culture, we are individualists. We like to compete against each other. And you think, if I share my idea with that 
friend of mine. He will do it before me and become my competitor. Start to think differently. Because that idea that each one will compete against each other stops all of us from doing anything, and we all do nothing, except what we can do as a sole trader, which is the lowest level of business. So start to ask God to show you who you can trust, who you can work with. And once you start praying the right prayers, God will lead you to the right people. Somebody who is godly, who also likely recognizes that the surplus is not just for self-gratification, the surplus is for God's kingdom. In the process of putting God's kingdom first, all the things that you need, food, shelter, and so on, will be added unto you while God's kingdom is first. And then don't just think about good ideas. Do them. And if you fail, it is better to fail and try again until you succeed than to say, I wish I had, but I never did. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the collective wisdom that you have already placed inside of us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have ideas. And we pray that you will help us to overcome the fear that stops those ideas from coming into practice. And remind us, Lord, at every stage in our life, the tenth is always yours. The whole world belongs to you and you're looking for people you can trust. Here we are, Lord. Trust us. Make us worthy of your trust so that we can be those who gather the wealth of this world and use it to build your kingdom. And in so doing, we know that all that we need will be added unto us, providing your kingdom is first. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.